Today, I'm gonna to talk about Betsy Ross, different aspects about her life, uh, how she became a cultural icon, and the general importance of women in American revolutionary history. First off, uh, her birth name was Elizabeth Griscom. She was born on January 1st, 1752 in Philadelphia to a Quaker family, a very large Quaker family, um, Rebecca and Samuel. Uh, she was number eight of 17 children. She attended Quaker school. Um, this was a generation of craftsmen. So when she got a little bit older, her father set her up with an internship with a guy named William Webster, who was an upholsterer and she learned how to become a seamstress. Um, but at the young age of 17, or young age of 21, the year 1773, she crossed the river to New Jersey to elope with a guy named John Ross, who she fell in love with, who was also a apprentice for Webster, her boss. And, but he was the son of an Episcopal rector, which is a double act of defiance that got her expelled from the Quaker church. I don't know how many of you know this, but in that Quaker culture, if you married outside the family, um, outside of uh, married someone who was not a Quaker, you lost your essentially your history, your family, your town, your culture, everything. Um, so they moved, the Rosses started their own upholstery shop and John joined the militia. And at barely two years of marriage, um, John died and she became a widow. In the summer of 1776, potentially 1777, Betsy Ross, newly widowed, is said to have received a visit from General George Washington regarding the design for a flag for the new nation. He was accompanied by George Ross, which is her uncle, and what a lot of historians believe gives validity to the argument that she was the one that sewed the flag because that's how that she could have been mentioned um, as a candidate. And then also Robert Morris was there too. Um, Washington and the Continental Com Congress had come out with a basic layout, but according to the legend, Betsy allegedly finalized the design and argued for five stars or five pointed stars instead of six, which Washington had suggested. Uh, because she folded the cloth and cut it with a single snip, which she told uh, Washington apparently that they would be able to make the flags more quicker and make more of them if they did five-pointed stars. Um, apparently, Washington also uh, suggested that the flag be square, but Mrs. Ross said it should be rectangular because it can flow more freely. Uh, many argue the validity of the Betsy Ross story. Uh, she has become such a popular cultural icon, and the story of her creating the first American flag might not even be true. According to Jody Gilmore, a writer published in The New American, uh, William Canby, which is Betsy's grandson, told the Stars and Stripes story publicly for the first time in 1870 at a meeting of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. He had recorded the story for family as much earlier as 1857. Realizing that his own word might not be sufficient, he obtained several affidavits from B Betsy's close relatives testifying to the accuracy of the basic facts that General George Washington visited Betsy. Uh, she gave him a design, um, she made suggestions, and essentially that's how it all went down. Uh, the affidavits are bolstered by another family's tradition. A close friend of Betsy, Sam Weatherhill, passed down his descendants a safe containing a five-pointed star which was a little withered cloth five-pointed star, which is said, according to the tradition, to have been that original star design that Betsy cut up for uh, General Washington. Many criticize the validity of Camby's story, but honestly, there's no substantiating records that show that Ross was the seamstress chosen for the flag project, but also there's little evidence to suggest that she wasn't. So honestly, we're at the point where historians are like, you know, who knows? There's evidence for it, there's evidence against it. But what is important to remember um, in this is that women played an important role in revolutionary history. Um, in the beginning, you had groups like the Daughters of Liberty. Um, after the British Parliament passed the Stamp Act, the Daughters of Liberty was formed, established in 1765, and organized was comprised solely of women who sought to demonstrate their loyalty to the revolutionary cause by boycotting British goods and making their own. Martha Washington, which is obviously General George Washington's wife, and our eventual first lady was the one of the prominent daughters of liberty. Although women were barred from serving in the military or in militias, they assisted the cause in crucial ways. Wives, girlfriends, daughters, sisters of soldiers and officers joined their camps to perform important tasks. Martha Washington accompanied her husband, General George Washington, during much of the war. 
Uh, these camp followers, as they were called, they cooked, cleaned, sewed, mended uniforms, tended to the ill and injured, and even herded animals, milked cows, and foraged for food. See, women often get overshadowed in American revolutionary history because of the predominance of male figures in important and crucial roles. But that does not mean women did not play an important part of the revolutionary cause, and it's important for historians to study this interesting history in order to further grasp the complexity of the historical narrative surrounding the American Revolution.